I suppose that one of the most extraordinary things about the whole case was the voice. Now, this voice was quite something. And how it started was this. On December the 10th, 1977 we're talking about, I was sitting in the room, in the, in the front room there, downstairs, with the mother and the children, and we were just talking, and suddenly there was whistling and going on. And I thought, that's funny, it's very sophisticated whistling. The children can't whistle like that. It sounds like the whistling that Mr. Nottingham does. He whistles quite a bit next door, but he's not there, he's at work. So crazy. Suddenly a dog barked in the room. Hmm, fine, a dog barked in the room. But there was no dog there. I thought, well, you know, this is even crazier still. And I began to think, you know, okay, it can whistle, it can bark. And the thing had began to turn around in my head. And it went on quite a bit. Then, lunchtime, about lunchtime, Guy Playfair came along and I said to Guy, this morning I heard a dog barking and whistling in the room and there was no dog there. And I said, it was a dog barking. Mm, well, he took everything in his stride, he always did. And we decided then that if it could bark and it could whistle, it maybe I should talk. And I said to Guy, well, I'll tell you what, if it happens this evening, I'm going to take the children into the bedroom by themselves and see whether it can talk. Now this was the day that nine other investigators, most of them scientists, were in the house. So we had quite a lot of people who heard the first noise that was made. About six o'clock in the evening, and everybody was there, got the barking and whistling again. Round about nine o'clock, if I remember rightly, I said to Mrs. Hodson, can I take the children upstairs? I want to do an experiment. She said, okay, I mean, she's used to it by now, she's used to everything. So I took the children upstairs and they got into bed. And in the next bedroom, in the small box room, Guy Playfair was there with his headphones on and we put a microphone in, in the room I was in with the children so he could hear all what was going on. Uh, and the barking and whistling was going on. Then I suddenly said, if you can bark and you can whistle, you can talk. Say my name. Mm, quite a while nothing happened and suddenly it said Morris I thought good <laughs> good some results and then I challenged it again I said no that's not my name because I didn't hear it properly you see it was like Morris or something like that so I said you know, say it again this time it said Morris quite clearly then I challenged it to say say Dr. Bellock Dr. Bellock one of my colleagues was there that, that night a very famous parapsychologist and it said Dr. Bellock so I knew that we had a voice now what was this voice how did it work first of all when it starts to speak I thought we had uh, a discarnate voice what we call discarnate voice a voice coming from nowhere out of the air then I began to realize when I watched the children more carefully and watched Janet particularly more carefully it was seen to be coming from her direction now, her lips weren't moving, her, her mouth wasn't moving. Her lips, a slight tremble on her lips, but that's all. But I noticed when the voice spoke, her chest went up and down. So I watched her very carefully. And then, after a while, I challenged her and I said, Janet, that voice is coming from you. She said, oh no, it's not. I said, yes, it's coming from you, Janet. She says, not. I said, if it's not coming from you, where is it coming from? She says, it's coming from behind me. I said, uh, you sure? She said, absolutely certain. That voice is not coming from me, it's coming from behind me. So we did a test later on, sometime later. We did a, just a simple test. Not terribly scientific, but a simple test. We put a microphone on the front of her throat, one on the back of her neck. And we found that the one on the back of her neck was louder than the one on her throat. Shouldn't be so.